how difficult life must have been for Lorca, a gay man living in early 20th century Spain, the land of machismo. Lorca believed that humans' only chance at happiness was in living one's instinctual life to the full, and this he was not able to do openly. He would have agreed with Martin Luther King Jr. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Lorca adored the surrealist painter Salvador Dali. He was drawn to Dali's rebelliousness, his absolute disregard of convention. Dali, he said, was consumed by desire for eternity with boundaries. I love that phrase. And it's a phrase that could apply equally well to Lorca and his poetry. Could this be why he was so very dangerous to the state? The idea that humans can reach out for an eternity with boundaries resists the commodification of identity that is so much a part of our media-defined lives. Well, I discovered Lorca's poetry about a dozen years ago when I stumbled across an idea that's at the center of his work and of all the Andalusian traditional arts, especially the flamenco music that Manuel played for us today, Duende. Day. There's no precise English translation for Duende, in literature, it's a trickster kind of spirit. But in the performing arts, it is the fire in the belly that, shared between performer and audience, makes a performance wholly unique and unforgettable. Duende is a struggle, not a thought, Lorca wrote. It is the spirit of the earth coming up through the soles of a dancer's feet. It is more than news, more than angel. It is a state of aliveness so absolute that it includes the very presence of death or the possibility of death. The only way to court it, Lorca would say, is to make oneself fully vulnerable. In Spain, Lorca tells us the dead are more alive than they are anywhere else. When a family member dies, the body is not whisked away to funeral home or crematorium, but allowed to remain home as long as possible. As the years go by, the dead are spoken to, included, thought of as spirits inhabiting the world and creating within us a sense of melancholy and longing. A little of this consciousness comes through the Mexican Dia de los Muertos, celebrated last week. A little less comes through our own American Halloween. It's important to say, though, that Orca was not romanticizing death, and neither am I. As a minister, I know that death, when it comes, is often not beautiful. No. Lorca was open to the presence of death because he wanted his poetry and his life to be truly wide awake, with beauty and horror and the ineffable and the repugnant existing side by side, knocking against each other in the midst of a passionate gaiety. I think this is why I feel so attracted to Lorca's poetry. I want my life and my heart to include it all, too. I want to be able to speak and hear the truth, even when it hurts like hell. I want this, and I'm afraid of it. In the family I grew up in, there was a long list of things we couldn't speak about. Race, sex, the inequities so visible to children that are woven into the social fabric. Death. We Americans have a death and loss denying culture. We keep our grief private, locked in a closet, and put on a happy face when we walk out the door. We're like Woody Allen. We aren't afraid of death. We just don't want to be there when it happens. No, we 
joke about it. We stave it off. Stave it off with Botox and extraordinary medical measures. We pretend. We pretend that reality is a television game about eating worms, not about being eaten by them. If you were president during the early days of a worldwide epidemic, as was Ronald Reagan, you let seven years go by before you even speak the name of the disease that is killing so many young men. Later, as the death toll mounts in Africa, ignore the science and refuse to fund programs that mention the word condom. More recently, don't show the Coffins coming back from war. Show the Commander-in-Chief in a flight suit on the deck of a war machine. In the context of this painful recent history, President Obama's symbolic flight to Delaware in the middle of the night 10 days ago to salute the bodies of American soldiers coming home from Afghanistan moved me deeply. Lorca's poetry screams against suppression of life, death, and truth. And I wonder, is showing the whole of life, including the deep song of our anguish, might this be dangerous to tyrants? In Lorca's last play, Bernarda Alba locks her mother up in a room because the old one is losing her inhibition and beginning to speak the truth. Bernarda lives angry and afraid. She curses the village, which she says is full of wells when you, where when you drink, you're always afraid the water's been poisoned. And today we would add, by terrorists. Lorca finished this play just before the Spanish Civil War began. For months, the fascist party had been imitating Hitler's brown shirts, intentionally creating civil disorder and stirring up middle class fear, setting the, setting the stage for a coup that would seem to be necessary to restore law and order. The Spanish Civil War was the war that Hemingway, Orwell, and Picasso paid homage to in some of their greatest works. And when it began in 1936, it was seen as a dress rehearsal for the conflict that was soon to sweep all of Europe. In an age when many young intellectuals in his circle were joining the Communist Party, Lorca declined. He was not a political man, he said, but then again, he did own that he was a revolutionary, in the same way he said that all true poets, including Jesus Christ, are revolutionary. Well, it wasn't safe to let him know it is. Federico Garcia Lorca was arrested on August 16, 1936, a month after the Civil War began. Two or three days later, no one's entirely sure of the date, he was taken out and shot in a grove of olive trees by a spring named Fountain of Tears. He was 38 years old. The men who killed him and the men who ordered him killed are silent now and largely forgotten. But on the 100th anniversary of Lorca's birth, Thousands of copies of his poems were dropped from the sky all over Spain. In post-9-11 America, Lorca's life presents a dangerous choice between a world of militarized commodification and the kingdom of poetry where we are, in his words, anointed with love for all things. It's a revolutionary idea. Can we allow it to live inside of us?